Welcome, welcome. It's your host, Dr. Morgan. This is a very special episode. I'm starting a two-part series, the 34 things that you need to know that I wish someone would have told me. I'm playing around with the title, but I think here's the title of the episode. I don't pick the title until later, but it's going to be this. The 34 things that I wish someone would have told me about life and relationships, because we're going to talk of course, about relationships, you know me, but I'm also just going to give you some of my best ever life wisdom. My birthday is tomorrow, August 17th. So I don't want you to miss this episode. This is my gift to you. I'm just packing it full with gems, things that I think everyone would benefit from remembering. Even if you've heard these things before, it's going to be helpful to revisit it. So I'm so excited to dive in and yeah, 34 years on this planet. And I have been doing this podcast for three of those years. This is the third time I've done a birthday episode. So I'm just so excited to deliver this information to you. I know you're going to love it. Let's dive in. Okay. Number one is this without vision, the people will perish. Bible quote, very simple without vision we perish. And you could take this to mean we actually physically perish, or I interpret it as you kind of die on the inside. You don't have anything pulling you forward, right? You're without life. We need vision. This is something that I work really hard on in the Empowered Secure Love Program of supporting the women in there and developing their clear vision for their life, for their relationship vision pulls us forward without vision. We really suffer. So that's my top one. That's been a huge thing in my life is having a clear, clear vision. You can do the work to release the past and you need a vision that is exciting that pulls you forward. Okay. Number two, assertive is kind. This has taken me so long. How many of you can relate? If you're a people pleaser, if you have been so scared of abandonment, Whatever you've experienced in past relationships, you might struggle with this where you go, okay, I just shouldn't say anything. I should keep it to myself. Maybe it'll work itself out. That's my favorite. If I don't say anything, it'll just magically work itself out. We all know that's not how it works. Okay. Assertive is kind. People cannot read our minds. And you have to realize that assertive doesn't mean that you steamroll people, that you're aggressive. Assertive means you express your needs, your feelings, you express your experience, and you're curious about other people's needs and feelings and experiences as well. So it's this beautiful way of communicating that is so kind to you and to everyone in your life. So that one takes a long time to really internalize and master, but it's huge. All right. Number three, number three, this is about avoidant attachment. This is something I just realized more and more and more about avoidant attachment. Avoidantly attached partners do crave love and connection. They're human. Of course, they crave love and connection, right? And here's the thing. They struggle to be emotionally available with themselves. So think about that. They're not meeting themselves. They're not understanding their own emotional experiences. They're probably shut down with themselves. And therefore, they struggle to be emotionally available for others, right? If I can't be emotionally available for me, I cannot be emotionally available for another person, right? And this is why they'll get so easily overwhelmed by other people's emotional experiences because they haven't had the experience of connecting with themselves on that level. So with avoidant attachment, one of the first things that's so important is building the relationship with self and creating that emotional safety within. And that's going to really support anyone who experiences that in becoming secure. So fun little avoidantly attached observation I've had, the more and more I've done this work. Point number four, this is a really good one. We're cruising right along. Point number four, self-worth is unconditional and steady. Self-confidence is up and down based on results. Self self-worth is unconditional and steady. Self-confidence is up and down based on your results. This is a Dr. Morgan quote. I think I've said this in other ways, but it felt really important to revisit. You have to realize your self-worth is unshakable. You are worthy because you are. You exist so you are worthy. You are enough. You are a valued human being. You are a valuable part of this world, 
just because you are. I want you to take that in, okay? Self-worth is unshakable. Now, a lot of people confuse self-confidence for their self-worth. So they connect their self-worth to the roller coaster of self-confidence. And this has devastating impacts, um, including mental health concerns, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the deal. Self-confidence is based on, do you keep the promises that you make to yourself? Do you show up and do the things? Can you rely on yourself to get stuff done? We build self-confidence through behaviors and through our results. That's how self-confidence works, right? And when we have connected self-worth to self-confidence, it's actually really hard to build self-confidence because we beat ourselves up all the time and say, I'm not enough. I'm a failure whatever. When in reality, it's like, Hey, you're just building your self-confidence muscle. You're just teaching yourself to show up and to do things. Um, but I, I view self-confidence as being really connected to, are you in alignment with your highest and best self? Are you keeping the promises to yourself? Are you honoring your needs? Sometimes we have to build self-confidence around self-care that if I know that I need self-care, that I show up and I honor my self-care and then I have more self-confidence in knowing, Hey, yeah, I'll show up and take care of me. I, I got me. I can rely on myself. So these are two very different things that oftentimes get confused in our experiences. And it's really important to separate the two. Okay. I could talk about that for an entire episode. It's so very hard for me to move on, but we're going to move on because I want you to get all these points and it's just getting juicier and juicier as we go. Okay. Point number five, are you with me? Ready is a lie. Ooh, I get goosebumps because if I had waited till I felt ready to launch this podcast, we would not have a podcast. Okay. If I had waited until I was ready to build the Empower Secure Love program, we would not have helped over 400 people. Ready is a lie. You owe it to yourself to take messy action. You must take messy action. I'm quoting two of my favorite other female entrepreneurs that I know. Ready is a lie is Angie Lee. Take messy action is something that Lori Harder always says um, to female you know, um, business owners that I really look up to. And it's so true. It's not just in business. This applies to every area of your life. Here's the thing. We always feel better when we take action. If we're sitting in inaction and we're, we're spiraling, we're catastrophizing, we're imagining all the worst case scenarios, and we're not actually taking action towards something, then we're going to feel worse. Additionally, um, if you're trying to plan out the perfect execution and wait till everything's perfect, and you're just planning everything out in your mind, you're not going to base things in reality because you actually don't have data until you take action. So it's like, if I'm waiting to go on a date with someone and then I'm planning out how we're going to handle date number three, and then how we're going to handle the six months, and then what's going to happen in our one year. And then what's our wedding going to be like, right? Like you wouldn't do that, right? Like we need to just take action and gather data that's how we make progress in life. So anytime you're waiting for the perfect moment, just take some action and you'll know what to do based on the action. This is big in career too, huge, um, of being willing to just take some action. Okay. Remember, ready is a lie. Take messy action. Point number six. I love this point. Social media isn't real. Okay. I'm here to tell you, I've met some of your favorite influencers in person. Uh, I'm I all the time. I'm just aware that what people post online is the highlight reel, y'all. It is not a reflection of what's going on. We actually have no idea about someone's life or their relationship unless we meet them. We see this all the time with relationships that we think are going well. What was it? Caitlin Bristow's breakup recently. If you would have looked at her relationship, relationship from the outside, you would have no idea that they were even struggling at all. So you cannot compare yourself to strangers on the internet. The internet isn't real. Social media isn't real. Please stop comparing yourself. Okay. I need you to take that one in now more than ever. It's so important to have a healthy relationship with social media for your mental health. So please take that one in. Point number seven. I love this. This is something I wrote. Okay. But this is a combination of things I've heard, but here's my interpretation of it. 
We do not rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our standards, our beliefs, and our identity. We do not rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our standards, our beliefs, and our identity. Here's what I know. Anytime you want to achieve something, you have to create the standards, the beliefs, and develop the identity that supports the goal. So instead of achieving its being, who are you being? This is why when I talk about healing and being able to attract the partner you want, you can focus so, so much on that partner that you want and you could write it all out and focus, focus on that. And it's not going to do any good until you become the version of you who attracts that person. We must be a certain way. This fitness is such a good example here. Okay. If I want to make some healthy lifestyle changes, I want to feel fit. I want to feel strong. I can't just say, well, I will be an athlete. I will do blah, blah, blah. I'll be able to deadlift 200 pounds, whatever your goal is. I'll run a 5k in under 25 minutes, whatever your goal is. Okay. If you do not back it up with the identity piece, and you do not back it up with beliefs, and you do not back it up with standards, it's not going to happen. So a standard would be, I move my body every day. I work out every day. This is my training plan. My identity is, I am an athlete. I go to the gym every day at 7 a.m., right? So you have to think about when you have a goal, sure, think about the goal. It's important to get clear on the goal and get clear on beliefs, standards, identity, And then you will not only achieve the goal, you will maintain it for life and you'll continue to grow it. So really, really important there. Uh, Point number eight of things that I wish that someone would have told me about relationships and life. Okay. These are things that would have been really nice to know when I was a 20 something. Uh, So I'm giving this wisdom to you now so that you can take it in. And maybe it's some things you've heard before, but we're on point. Number eight, and it's one sentence, peaceful, but never satisfied. People wonder, you know, how I achieve a lot and in comparison to others, I haven't really achieved that much. I'm fully aware of that. Um, and I'm confident because I know that I, it's me versus me and I'm in a wonderful place in my life, but people will be like, wow, you've done so much. And here's the thing. I am peaceful. I am whole. I have stable self-worth. I have a great relationship with myself. And I believe in being never satisfied in terms of impact, in terms of what you can build, in terms of how you can grow as a human. If we get to this place where we're quote unquote satisfied or complacent, as humans, we get really bored. Have you ever been through a period of your life where you got all your routines are dialed in. You're doing the same things over and over. You don't have anything new. You don't have anything that's challenging you. That is a recipe for um, a lot of mental health issues, <laughs> midlife crisis, dissatisfaction. Humans are wired for growth. We're supposed to grow. So, you know, Tony Robbins always says, if you're not growing, you're dying. And it's true. It's like, we have to grow. But I think it's really important to be peaceful, to be peaceful on the growth path which is taking me a long time to cultivate. So I love this sentence. This comes from David Goggins. He is a whole phenomena himself. If you've never read his book, check it out. He has two now, but I love this quote from him, peaceful, but never satisfied and honoring those two simultaneously. So the dialectics of I can hold, yes, I'm peaceful. I'm also never satisfied. Okay. Quote number nine, this is a a Kobe Bryant quote. I love Kobe Bryant, one of my favorite athletes of all time. I'm a huge basketball fan. I don't talk about that as much, but my family's a basketball family. I I just have always loved basketball. Um, So Kobe, rest in peace, Kobe. We appreciate your time on this earth. And Kobe says this, those times when you get up early, when you stay up late, when you're too tired, when you don't want to push yourself, but you do it anyways, that is actually the dream. So for me, what does that mean? 
all, all the things in my life that have been really meaningful, that have been super worthwhile, have involved falling in love with the process. And so often we get so connected to the outcome, so connected to the outcome. The women I work with in the program, it's about, oh, I just want to meet my person, right? But what about the process? When we can say the dream is actually me showing up and surrendering to growth and surrendering to the process, that is actually the dream of who am I becoming in pursuit of the goal? It can never be about the goal itself because that's temporary. You reach the goal, you're happy for a couple hours, yeah, you move on. We have to fall in love with the process of becoming. And for me, this obviously has been a few times in my life. I think getting my PhD in clinical psychology, I had to fall in love with the process so much pain and struggle and suffering. (laughs) Anyone in grad school, you know what I'm talking about. Or if you went to grad school yourself, you know, all the hoops, the late nights, all the papers, the dissertation, the dissertation defense, the clinical hours, the uh, being videotaped, doing therapy, the licensure process, taking a 500 question licensure exam. I could go on and on and on, right? Like the process of who I became so much more valuable than that diploma. Who I became in the process is what I'm really grateful for. Same with building this amazing mission that I have of helping as many women as possible and building the podcast, building the community. It's been the process. Who have I become in the process? The privilege of being a leader in a mission-driven organization. I have become someone entirely different in the process in a good way, right? Like it's, it's amazing. So I just want you to think about that wherever you are in your life, instead of getting so focused on the goal, can you surrender to the process and actually enjoy the process and have gratitude for the process, even when it's hard, because you are becoming someone different in that process. All right. Number 10, this is good. This is uh, Marcus Aurelius, a little stoicism for you. Um, I believe this might be be adopted by Ryan Holiday. I'm not 100%. To be honest, I just had this written down and I know it's a stoic quote, but I'm not exactly sure if it was Ryan Holiday or Marcus Aurelius. Shout out Ryan Holiday, obviously, if I'm not sure. (laughs) He's a wonderful writer. But anyways, I'll I'll get to the quote here. The quote is, never believe what anyone says about you, good or bad. I'll say that again. Never believe what anyone says about you, good or bad. Do not believe the bad stuff and certainly do not believe the good stuff. Draw your own conclusions about yourself. Listen to your own counsel. No one knows you better than you. Ooh, I love this. We get so worried about what people think about us. What are they going to say, right? You got to realize that ultimately life is short. Life is short and the opinion that matters most is what you think of yourself. There's a little bit of a caveat to this quote, which I think is the people who are really close with you, where you really value their opinion, your loved ones, your significant other, um, people really close to you who have earned your vulnerability and earned your trust over time. Of course, we want to know, right? If there's, we want them to give us feedback, um, but ultimately draw your own conclusions about yourself. And that requires so much self-honesty to be your own evaluator. You have to be able to operate with so much self-honesty. So I, I love this quote. And I especially love that it says, don't believe the good stuff. If our well-being is controlled by what others think of us, even if it's good or bad, we are giving away our power. You have to realize that, that your power is taken away when you rely on others to give you that dopamine hit, to tell you that you're good enough. So you have to develop a relationship with yourself where you say, you know what matters? What I think of me. And that's taken me a long time, but I'm there now more than ever. Um, And I can tell you this, it's way better way to live than caring what strangers on the internet think of you or caring what your friends think of you or what um, that girl, Stacy from high school thinks of you, like you got to care what you think of you. And that's where your true power lies. Okay. All right. Point number 11, we're, we're cruising here. We're getting through it. Point number 11. You ready? 
The relationship standards that you set with yourself will determine how others treat you. So I have a great example of this. Let's just say that for yourself, you are critical. You put yourself down. Maybe you call yourself names. You look in the mirror and you say, oh, who would want to be friends with you? Blah, blah, blah. If that is how you are treating you, you are allowing that to come into your life from other people as well. And you're likely also really susceptible to being critical of others. So a self-critical standard of that's your norm, you're inviting more of that into your life. There's a ton of other examples. Just take anything, right? Of, hey, I love myself. I honor myself. I appreciate who I am. Guess what? You welcome more of that into your life and your relationships. Or what about this? What about my needs are not important? I'm not going to take care of myself in the morning. I don't have time for a morning routine. Guess what? People go, oh, she can do this. She can do that, right? Like they they don't see you as someone with boundaries. So then you end up getting in relationships where all you do is give and give and give, but that's the standard you set with you. You wouldn't show up for you and carve out time to take care of yourself. So guess what? Others are not going to respect that you need time for you and that you have boundaries and that you say no to things. So the relationship you have with yourself, the standards you have with you, set the standards for all of your other relationships. So anytime you're not getting the relationship results you want, I would really encourage you to take a look at how you're treating yourself in that way as well. Okay. We're getting towards the end here. I'm getting to 17 things today and we are on number 12. Are you ready? This is from Naval Ravikant. He says, there's three things in life, your health, your mission, and the people you love. That's it. I love this quote. We can get so distracted. We can get so tied up in all the things going on, right? Watching the latest reality show or Scandaval, whatever the heck, I don't know. You can get so consumed by all different things in life and wanting to look a certain way or whatever. There's a ton of distractions. But when you think about it, what are the things that really matter? And I resonate with this so much. Your health, your mission, and the people you love. Okay. Your health, your mission, and the people you love. For me, it's like health is just a pillar. You got to take care of you. If, If you don't feel healthy, and this isn't just physical, this is mental, this is emotional, this is spiritual, this is your attachment style. Okay. If you don't feel healthy, how can you show up for other people? You can't, you cannot show up for others. So your health is number one. And then your mission personally, this is probably controversial, but I think that all of us have a mission. It's just that not all of us have tuned into it. Not all of us have been brave enough to really tune into the desire on our heart. And it doesn't mean that it's your career, but your mission could be as simple as, Hey, I go help out at the humane society on the weekends. I feel really called to care for animals or Maybe your mission is to write a book and that you want to help people in that way. I do believe all of us have a mission. And when you don't tune into it, you're cutting yourself off from that feeling of fulfillment that comes from being connected to a purpose. So mission is important. Okay. However that shows up in your life, I'm not saying you have to be like me and build an entire company around it. Uh, but you probably would benefit from tuning in and saying, yeah, what kind of impact do I want to make on the world? What's important to me? And then the people you love, man, I get emotional when I think about this because um, when I was really struggling in my past with unhealed trauma and childhood wounds and a disorganized attachment style and binge drinking, numbing, all kinds of ways that I could and uh, going through that time in my life, I could not show up well for the people that I loved. It's August and it was my sister's eighth wedding anniversary. Her and her husband have been together eight years. They're a wonderful couple. And, uh, it was really painful for me to remember that when I was my sister's maid of honor, I could not show up for her because I was so tied up in my own trauma, in my own stuff, my own disorganized attachment. I was so emotionally drained. I was going through a breakup, I think, as her shower was happening. And I did not show up for her. I did not show up for her. And 
it's amazing to me to think how much my life has changed now that I have worked on myself and the joy, the pure joy and gratitude that I get for showing up for my family. It's not just my family. It's my friends too, right? Like people I love in my life, being stable enough in my own life that I can then show up and give to others. It's a whole different way to live. And I'm, I'm so grateful that, that I have that because it is, it's one of those top three. It's one of the only things that matters, the people you love, right? How do you show up? So, um, yeah, I, I really take this one to heart. And I hope that when you hear that, you think about, well, what do those three things look like in my life? And how could I, how could I work on reprioritizing? And if you need to heal, it's not a judgment of yourself. I don't look back at that past version of myself and say, oh, she was so selfish. The reality is that I was selfish and it was all I knew how to do to survive at the time. I'm not judging that past version of me. I have a lot of compassion and I know that it was so unhealthy that it negatively impacted the people around me. And now that I get to be Aunt Morgan and I get to go to the birthday parties and I get to watch my niece and nephew for a while while you know my sister and her husband get to go out and uh, it's just a whole different level of giving and presence and love that's only been available because I chose to heal. That's the truth. Okay. I could go on and on. We got to wrap. We got to get through it. Okay. We're at point number 13. True emotional regulation and secure attachment allows for deeper feeling. I can hold bigger emotions without shutting down and without going off the rails, without getting completely emotionally dysregulated, right? The the paradox here is the more secure you are, the more stable you are, the more you can actually allow for depth of emotion and, and depth of connection and depth of love. I feel things more deeply because I have the capacity to do so. I'm emotionally emotionally regulated, emotionally stable. So that allows for me to hold bigger emotions and deeper emotions. So I think that's a really powerful paradox. Okay. Point number 14. Oh, I already talked about this, but I'll say it again. <laughs> becoming the best version of myself impacted my family and friends in ways that I could have never predicted. My greatest gift in my healing journey is being able to show up well for the people I love. I really mean that. Like, yes, I show up well for myself. Yes, I have an incredible partner. We have a beautiful, securely attached relationship. We love each other. It gets better every day. Seriously, it's amazing. And I get to show up for my family and friends and really show up for them and really be there and be present. And that is such an unexpected gift of healing for me. Um, And I'm just, I'm incredibly grateful for it. Point number 15, great relationships make you more of who you are. A supportive partner does not cause you to shrink yourself. So this is so true for me. Like I'm going to LA, I'm going to New York. um, And there's a lot of really awesome career opportunities I have and people I network with and gosh, late nights writing and all kinds of things that I do. uh, And I get to do more and more and become more of who I am because I'm with someone who supports it. If I, if I was by myself, I think I would be also doing these things. And I'll be honest, I feel braver. I take more risks. I'm willing to really go after it more with a supportive partner. So I think the right partner helps you become braver. You know that you're not in a good relationship if you're losing parts of yourself, if you're shrinking, if you're saying no to things and you're saying, well, what would they think? Or I just want to make them happy or, oh my gosh, that's going to interrupt our time together on the weekends. Like, obviously there's compromise. Yes, you need quality time together and the right partner for you is going to cheer you on while you go after your dreams. They are going to cheer you on. Okay. I think about... Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, beautiful example, supportive couple. And of course, they had to come up with ways, I think, to maintain their relationship during something as stressful as being the president. And they're cheering each other on and Michelle's doing her thing. And, you know, they're they're just a really 
great public example, but there's a lot of examples of this and, and think about it. Like who are the couples that you see where they're really both following paths that light them up and they're supported by each other. I can name some other ones too. Um, Lori Harder, Chris Harder, and Keisha Gamitri. I think I might be saying her name wrong, but I know her, she was on my show at one point and her and her husband are both entrepreneurs and her husband's doing real estate investing and she's running retreats and they have this beautiful relationship where they they cheer each other on. Um, so just think about that. The right partner makes you more of who you are. Okay. Point number 16. Morning routines are sacred and they change over time. So how do we honor both of those truths? I'll tell you how I've done it. One of the things that totally changed my life is creating space for myself in the morning. When I worked a traditional job that was in person, I would get up at 5 a.m. in order to create that space for myself because I knew, okay, this is the commitment to myself. I'm showing up for me. I'm rebuilding my self-worth. I am teaching my brain that I am worthy of showing up for me. So yes, it was sacred. And now that time I'm very grateful is more like 6 a.m., but I would still get up at 5 a.m. if I had to because that time is sacred. And what I've learned is different seasons of life require different morning routines. And what's worked for me really well is creating the space and then feeling into what is it that I need. And I usually plan it out the week before. So on Sunday night, another one of my tips, I could have this could have been its own point. Sunday night, I always plan out the week ahead. I sit down, I look at my calendar, I write everything out. Yes, I handwrite it. I don't just rely on Google. I write little check boxes, little, little boxes, blank boxes next to each thing. And I plan my morning routine. What feels good to me this week in the morning? Non-negotiables for me, lifting weights and walking. It's been different things at different times though. Like seasons where yoga was really important. Seasons where meditation and reading was really what I needed. And yeah, I would do some walking as well, but I really need to focus on my brain more. Um, Seasons where boxing was what I did. Like create the space and intentionally fill it. But the most important thing is creating the space. Okay. Point number 17. This is our last one. Okay. The last tip for this episode of part one. I can't wait to do part two. I hope you've got a lot of value out of this. If you have loved these, please make sure you share this episode on Instagram and your story and just tag me. I would love to see if you've loved this episode, of course. Um, So let's wrap it up. Point number 17 is that people pleasing is a lifelong recovery process. You don't just one day say, okay, I'm fully, (laughs) fully assertive and ready to set all the boundaries. And I will no longer people please ever again in my life. You can make so much progress. You can really become securely attached. You can become very aware. You can you can get really, really good at assertive communication. And you will always have a little bit of a trigger or perhaps a tendency to people please. And it's probably going to come up when you're really stressed, when maybe you didn't sleep at all. It's probably going to come up when you're going through major changes. Um, it can come up with certain people. I've, I work with so many people who say, family is just really triggering, right? And it makes sense. You had those relationships from birth. Those are the hardest relationships to change. The longer the relationship is, the relationship culture is almost set in stone and it's really hard to change it. So you're probably going to have triggers or times where people pleasing is just more prominent for you. And the best thing you can do is to have compassion not judge yourself when it comes up and then prepare for it. If you know, Hey, I'm going to be around these people and this is going to make me want to people, please prepare for it ahead of time. Get those boundaries ready to set, know how you're going to communicate assertively, remind yourself, my needs matter. I need to express myself assertive is kind and go into it prepared and imagine it going well. This is something that really helps with people pleasing Imagine setting the boundary and the conversation going well 
and you feeling heard and the other person feels heard and the boundary is set and the results are great. If you can imagine that, you're going to be so much more likely to be able to people please. I mean, to not, you're going to be so much better able to not people please. Let me emphasize that. Okay. I hope you loved this episode. This was so fun. 17 things that I wish somebody would have told me about life and relationships. And then we're going to go through the next 17 things on the next episode. And I think I'm going to focus a little bit more on relationships. Today was a lot of life wisdom, success wisdom, but we'll talk a little bit more about relationships in part two. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for being part of this community. I love you all and just really, really grateful to have grown with you over the years. So I hope you like this episode. Make sure you share it to Instagram. Share it with someone who needs it. And of course, of course, I'm wishing you high self-worth and great relationships. I'll talk with you soon.